are to include American citizens to be interned without a hearing. And, and then later on, they changed my grant card to four seats, which is an don't think if you are Asian people or white, I think you don't go up in this country. You're not American. And, and, and I thought that was wrong. After I was arrested, and I went there and I lied on the cop and I said, Gee, Joe, I was out there this. 1942, an ordinary American an extraordinary statement. Fred Korematsu boldly opposed the forced internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. After being convicted for failing to report or relocation, Mr. Korematsu took his case all the way to the Supreme Court. The High Court ruled against him. Fred Korematsu's case represented the trial that Japanese Americans never had. This was a child population that, without evidence, without trial, without due process of any kind, is simply swept into uh, internment camps, um, many losing their property, uh, some even losing their lives. The real significance of Fred's case is that it raised, for the first time, the central issue was the internment itself constitutional. It was, I think, for him, a personal show of recognition. Who am I? Am I an American? What does it mean for me to be an American? If you look at a Fred Corp, you see a very ordinary man. Um, who just wanted to be left alone, but who defied the United States government because he knew it was wrong. Some names of ordinary citizens stand for millions of souls. Plus, Brown. Parks. To that distinguished list, today we have the name Fred Ross. Here in the sailor suit, uh, it's my, my daddy. I think that was kind of a hand me down. 
But he was uh, the third son of four boys. So he had a, an older brother, um, uh, Hi, who was, I think he's over here to, to the right, or no, behind him. Second oldest, he was also So my boss was ordered, always ordered to do the chores that nobody else wanted to do. But he went to Castlemont High School in Oakland and experienced racism at that time. In fact, because my grandfather's flower business, he, he would help as his brothers did. And one day he went into San Leandro, which I don't know if you know where that is. It's a smaller church to, to Oakland. And he was delivering some flowers and he um, uh, wanted to get something to eat. So he went into uh, a diner and the cook behind the, the um, counter said, well, what do you want? And my father said, well, I want to get something to eat. And he said, well, you don't belong here. You go down to Chinatown, Chinatown and started blurting out some obscenities to him. And so that really hurt my father. And in fact, as you can see with that wonderful head of hair, uh, he wanted a haircut because my grandmother used to cut his hair. And so when he was in high school, he said to her, oh, I'm a big boy, so I want to go to a real barber shop. So again, he went into to San Leandro because it was only a few blocks away from where they lived. And walked into a barber shop, and the barber said, hey boy, what do you want? And my father said, well, I just want to get a haircut. No, you get out of here and start shouting names at them and vanities. You don't belong here. You go down to Chinatown. So that's how the, how the Asian Americans, especially, were being treated at that time. And in fact, before Pearl Harbor, there was the talk of a draft, something I hope you never experienced. Um, to because the, the government knew that you know we, that America was probably going to be getting into World War II, so he and his friends, his buddies, he had three Caucasian friends, were sitting around one one evening on a Friday night playing cards, and they decided that if they uh, enlisted together, they could stay together. So they went down to the local post office because that's how you in, in, enlisted into this um, armed services at that time, and they walked in and they went to the uh, uh, National Guard desk and asked for an application. And the, and the officer was giving applications to his three buddies, but not to my father. And the officer said well, to my father, well, what's your name? And he said, Kormatsu. And he says, well, you're Japanese. He said, yes. He says, well, I can't give you an, an application. And his buddies said, well, come on, Fred. You know, let, let's go down to the Coast Guard desk. So here again, the, the officer is giving him giving his, his three Caucasian buddies applications. And my father is waiting for his. And the uh, officer says, well, I have orders not to give anyone a, a, a Japanese an application. And my father said, but I'm an American. I want to serve my country. So how would you feel if someone said that to you? That here you wanted to do something for your own country that you lived in, that you grew up in, that you knew nothing else of any other country, and you were denied that that right. So as he got older, you can see that this, the the um, you know there this is about circa 1940, and my grandparents had worked very hard in this flower and she raised their family and. This is this is a state of what it looked like before Pearl Harbor. So once December seventh came along, he you know everyone was very afraid. What was going to happen? What was going to happen to everyone, especially if they were Japanese? Because the racist the racist remarks started building up. And in fact, I always hated to see this photograph because even in elementary school, and I went to to elementary school in in, um, in in San Lorenzo, which is you know in the in the East Bay, and around this time, the kids would always kind of point out what was happening and would say to me that I didn't belong here. You know, I was Japanese, and they would blurt out name, you know, racist names and say, "Go back to Japan. You're you don't belong here. You know, it's your fault. It's your fault for the bombing of Pearl Harbor," which really wasn't fair. 
And it really hurt me. You know, it was it, these types of things, this type of bullying, is not nice to experience. And in fact, my brother experienced the same type of treatment, but we never even talked about it. We never told our parents um, about what we were experiencing at that time. And so with the buildup of, of the war, you know, this is Rosie the Riveter. I don't know if you've said to her yet, but she was kind of symbolizing, you know, women getting into helping um, the cause of, of the service. But also the Japanese and Japanese Americans were being demonized. So this is this is what was happening across the country. You know, people said, oh, these people, you know, if, if they're Japanese or even if they're born here, you know, they don't they don't belong here. They're dangerous. And so on on February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt issued a document called Executive Order 9066 which gave the military the authority to force remove anyone of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. So, I'm, if you, if I'm half Japanese, but you only had to be 116th Japanese and you still had to um, leave your home and put, be put into a prison camp. And this is going up on telephone poles and in communities to uh, to tell people that basically they have to to get ready to leave their and around up and down the coast. This is in, actually in Oakland, and this is even the title to, to my father's story. I am American. What does it mean American in this country? Now my my father. To be an American was to, to give back to this country and to be involved in community service. And even if you're not born here, even if you're not an American citizen, you help those people who are immigrants, who, who have issues and are trying to make a better life for themselves here. That's what being an American is. This shows, this is a, a map that shows um, basically the internment camps. Um, and the, real, and the uh, detention assembly centers that were first on the West Coast. There was um, first the zone one that the military demarcation line goes up and down the, the center of the states, but then they expanded it to include all of California because two of the internment camps were here. Um, yeah, I can't really kind of see from this, um, but Manzanar and Tule Lake were the two that were in California. But they went as far as um, as Arkansas, and oh, there it is, over there. Uh, but you know, that's that's how spread out these internment camps were. Now you only had basically 48 hours to decide what you could take with you. So imagine your parents have a whole house, you have a room. You can only take with you what you can carry in two hands. Basically, 50 pounds each. That's it. And you also had to take bedding because you didn't know, you know, you had to provide that, and, and then also you didn't know what kind of climate that you're going to be living in. Uh, and so, you know, back in those days, you couldn't take even, you know, flashlights if you had a baseball bat. You, they considered that a weapon. And if it, something like this occurred now, you would not be able to take anything electronic. No computers, no iPods. Nothing like that. So you have to leave all that behind. And so people had to decide, especially you know, parents, what they could sell if, in that short of time, what they could leave with friends, um, and what they could take with them, and what they had to leave behind. So in, some, in a lot of cases, people thought, well, I'll give this to my neighbor and ask my neighbor to hold on to, this, on, to, hold on to these possessions for me. And in some, in a, in, in a lot of situations, people didn't even think that the Japanese and Japanese Americans were even coming back to the West Coast. So they would get rid of the whatever they had, or they would sell it, or they would use it. And so this is kind of the, the, the feeling that was happening at the time. These young boys don't look very happy, uh, you know, certainly. And there are two cases for soft-sided, obviously. They are bulging. And, and after you moved in, into a detention assembly center, which were basically horse stalls. So in, in the film, 
in the trailer, my father was re referring to GPJO was a lot better than this. So you have to report like to these um, racetracks in the area. Most of them went up to uh, San Bruno to Tamaran, and they would just whitewash the horse stalls. Uh, you have a dirt floor, you have a mattress with some straw in it, you have a light bulb, and it still smells like manure. Now, we treat animals better than we treated the Japanese and the Japanese Americans at that time. And so after the, the government had time to build permanent camps across the U.S., to the train stations, you can see now you know, those Japanese Americans are really dangerous looking with all these armed guards here. And they, when they rode across the United States in these trains, they had to ride with the shape down because they didn't want anybody to see out and they didn't want anybody to see in. And you ended up in some place like this. Usually it was an Indian reservation, no trees, hotter than ladies in the, in the summertime, freezing cold in the wintertime, you might have a pot that is still on either end of the barrack. Uh, and in a lot of cases, several families would be in one barrack, and they would just string rope across uh, the barracks and hang sheets um, or blankets, and that's how the different families lived for three or more years. And the mess halls and the latrines were way over here. Uh, you, in the mess halls, the, the way that these were built were just wood and tar paper, and the slats sometimes were open, so if you had a sandstorm, and see how that looks. The, the food, the sand would come up into their food and then they couldn't even eat their food. And, you know, they said, well, this, you know, to put the Japanese Americans in, in these prison camps really is for their own protection. But we, I always found it strange when I learned and saw this that they actually the guns were pointed in at the people. If you're going to protect someone, you're out. And in fact, one man, uh, got too close to this barbed wire because he's hard of hearing and the, the military officer up here was shouting at him and because he went south of the wire, I don't know if you can see this, but he was just kind of collecting some driftwood uh, or some, some, some other items to, to make a, a craft uh, piece and the, um, uh, the guard and killed him. And this could be you guys, living behind bar wire in a prison, and you've done nothing wrong. And so teachers had to create their own classrooms. And I want you to shout out, what is this document? That's right. And I don't know if you can see this up here. Shout out, what are these three words? Louder. That's right. This Constitution is about you. This is a, a precious document in this country, and we continually have to fight for, for our, our civil rights. And Mary Bethel championed on more about this too. But don't forget this, because my father learned about the Constitution in high school. So that was, that was how he was able to make some of the decisions that he did, because he thought he had civil rights. Think about it. You think you have civil rights. And then the government says, no, you don't. Is that right? No. And so the 4th and 14th Amendment especially were totally violated. So when the Japanese were told they had to leave their homes, there were no charges. So all due process was totally violated just because of a military. So it took two years for my, my father's Supreme Court case, uh, or his case to get to the Supreme Court. And he thought certainly by the time I got there, the court would see that, that this order was unconstitutional. And so when he learned that the, that the uh, court justices decided that it was, it was still okay for the government to incarcerate 120,000 people, two-thirds were American citizens, by the way, he was totally disappointed. 
But it should be pointed out that this was a 6 to 3 decision. I to use my father's Supreme Court case because it's still on the record um, as a reason to round up Arab Muslim Americans and possibly put them in. I'm 15 years old in this picture. I'm in high school. I'm studying American history. And our American history teacher uh, assigned each of us in our class a little paper. Mine was. So my friend. Some say third generation like me, got up in front of the class, and her book was called Concentration Camps USA. Hmm. Okay. Then she goes on and talks about the Japanese American internment. Oh, I say to myself, that's interesting. I never had heard about that before. And then, and then she goes on to say, but there was this one man who avoided the military orders and was arrested, and his case was a famous Supreme Court case, Cormonson versus the United States. Oh, that's my name. And the only thing I knew is that Cormonson is a unusual Japanese name. So I've got 35 pairs of eyes looking at me, you know, here in class, and still now, I'm still in and out. And, and I'm thinking, oh, it's so black, she's a fan. Because she never says bread. She just said four matzo versus United States. And so, actually, I thought maybe it was my, my father's oldest brother, who didn't turn out to be such a shining light after all, the firstborn. Or it could have been one of my grandfather's uh, brothers who was here before Pearl Harbor, but somehow disappeared. And so I asked my friend my after class, what's this about? She says, well, this is about your dad. No way, I said. Somebody would have told me. So I go home and I confront my mother and she goes, yes, this is about your father. And then I get the standard answer, wait till your father gets home and then you can talk to him about it. Three hours later, because my father experienced uh, uh, un uh, employment discrimination as well as housing discrimination, so he worked long hours. and. And so I asked him about this, and he said to me, well, you know, it happened a long time ago. And what he thought he did was right, and the government was wrong. And it was that clear and simple in his mind. And I could see the hurt in his eyes, and I couldn't ask him any more questions. The only thing I could blurt out was, can he vote? Because he had a criminal record. And, and he said, yes, he could, he could vote. Because voting was always very important to my parents. Because it is one of our, our cherished privileges in this country. We should not take it for granted. So when you all get older, vote. Uh, and so uh, it, it, was a, it was something that we didn't talk about. And the irony to the story is my brother found out the same way in high school. So obviously we didn't have dinner time. Fast forward 1983, this is the announcement that they have found the smoking gun. So if you saw Professor Peter Irons in the film, he's right here. He found the evidence in Washington, D.C. when he was doing research that, that proved that there was no military necessity for the Japanese and Japanese Americans 
to be forced to move from their home. In fact, there was other reports that had been issued at that time to, to the government to say um, that there was no, uh, there, you know, there was no evidence. And so they, um, they were able to reopen his case and his conviction was, was overturned. And that basically was as a precedent for the re uh, redress and reparations. The apology, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, was the official apology to the Japanese and Japanese Americans. This weight lifted off not only my father's shoulders, but their shoulders as well. Because the reason they never even talked about it, and my father didn't talk about it, is they just wanted to get on with their lives and be good American citizens. And so that's why my father uh, received the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So I want you to remember a couple of things. Remember to stand up for what is right. And when you see something wrong, don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. Frank Lamont is the current executive director of the Student Press Law Center, a nonprofit organization that provides legal counsel and uh, educational materials to student journalists. Uh, he, was, he has experience in both journalism and law. He was previously a reporter for um, several daily newspapers in Georgia and Florida. And uh, he graduated from the University of Georgia School of Law, where he was the senior editor of the Georgia Law Review. The Southern Interscholastic Press Association awarded him with the Elizabeth R. Dickey's Distinguished Service Award and the Society for Collegiate Journalists uh, awarded him with the Lewis B. Eagle Heart Freedom of Expression Award. Lamonti is currently accompanying our third speaker, Mary Beth Baker, on a tour across the nation aiming to educate students about their constitutional rights. Ms. Tinker, her brother John, and their friend Christopher Eckhart became plaintiffs in the 1969 Supreme Court case, Tinker v. Des Moines Independent School District, when they wore black armbands for the Vietnam War to school. The court case focused on the First Amendment of the Constitution and whether or not those rights were forfeited at the school house gate. Tinker won the case 7 to 2, thus setting a positive precedent for future issues of student free expression. Tinker is currently a youth rights and free speech activist. She began the Tinker Tour in 2013, aiming to promote free expression for students. We are lucky to be one of the five California schools with the Tinker Tour's visiting on their journey. So without further ado, we would like to present Frank Lamonti and Mary Beth Tinker.
by this historian today that even though it's a view in this room um, who are 16 or 17, 70 years it seems like it is an eternity. I mean, what we saw in these events are not ancient history. This is not Babylonia. We're talking about 70 years ago. And in one lifetime, right, history has advanced so rapidly that we can look back now at things that happened 70 years ago. We can just shake our heads and say, I can't believe we were ever so backward. I can't believe we ever thought that way in America. And I'm here to tell you that we're going to do that again in another generation. We're going to look back and we're going to say, I can't believe we ever thought that students were second class citizens. I can't believe we ever thought that. I can't think you ever thought of a single out kids as being some kind of other species that deserve differentially poor legal treatment. We have laws right now that folks in our country in places like North Carolina where you can go to jail just for making fun of a school administrator online, conduct that would be constitutionally protected. If you did it or I did it, you can spend a year in jail if you're a kid. We have kids in jail, we have kids who have been convicted of crimes in New York, in Wisconsin, convicted of crimes, not just in some other schools, just for mean Facebook pages. We're throwing jail at kids for meanness online. We're going to look back and shake our heads and say, I can't believe you ever saw it that way. And I hope it doesn't take us 70 years to get there. The, um, the other thing I want to say, the teacher tour and the whole purpose of it was to bring a piece of history into the backyards of people all across America to share a moment of history with all of you. But and that history is not always made by giants. Sometimes it's made by 13-year-olds. And sometimes it's made in really small moments where at the time it never occurs to you that this is a life-defining or world-changing moment. And so because of that, because small moments sometimes add up to amazing breakthroughs in history, we should treat everyone, everyone, like they might be a hero, because who knows they might be, and we should treat every moment like it might be a history-making one, because who knows it might be. Guys, so do awesome things, and I can't wait to hear from Mary Beth. Seriously, come on with the show. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you very much. Karen Coromato and Frank Lamonte, heroes of your life. Thank you. To be here with all of you at Harvard. I love the message that Sierra and Frank gave today about ordinary people speaking up for what's right. And your, your head of school here at Harvard, I believe in this wonderful new issue of the Wage Close. Yay! Where's all the journalists? All right. <laughs> Journalism is keeping the free press alive. Yes, he said, uh, Mrs. Nicholas, sometimes community standards are there to be challenged. Think so? Sometimes they're there for a reason, but sometimes we need to challenge things. And young people like you have been challenging things all through history. Did you know that? Yeah! <laughs> challenging, standing up, speaking up for a better way. We're coming from a place in our history where we had slaves building our White House and our capital. This is our great democracy. We were locking up Japanese in World War II, or simply being Japanese. And don't forget that we were at war with Germany. They didn't have internment camps for Germans, did they? Did we? No. But we had them for the Japanese. It's racism. We're, we're coming from a place where democratic values need to be realized. We need to grow our democracy and go towards better days and better values of equality, justice. These are our values that young people all through history have been standing up and speaking up for. In the 1950s, after the war, after Fred Korematsu took his courageous stand, in 1955, there was a young woman who sat on a bus and refused to get up off the bus. I was a small child. I was just growing up. Who was the young woman? Your mother. Rosa Parks. I knew you were going to say Rosa Parks. But you know who it was? Claudette Colvin. Yeah, Rosa Parks did her thing too, but Claudette did hers one year earlier. Also in Montgomery, Alabama. She was 15, 
15, 15 years old. She refused to get up off of the white section of the bus because she had learned in her history class that we're supposed to have democracy here. We're supposed to have equality. Where's all you history teachers, librarians, school administrators? All right. You have, all of you have your allies, your, your teachers who are teaching you about these values that we have. And Claudette stood up and spoke up a year before Rosa Parks, who was 15. As young people have all through history, because you have wonderful qualities. Like, what are some of them? Creativity, courage, strength, imagination, something that Einstein said was even more important than knowledge. And that same year, 1955, when Claudette and, okay, later, Rosa Parks took their action for democracy, there was another young woman. She was only 10 years old. She was 12 by then. Her name was Sadako Sasaki. And when she was two years old, her town, Hiroshima, in Japan, had been bombed by an atom bomb. And as she... She started developing leukemia from the radiation that she had been exposed to. But Sadako decided that she was going to start holding peace trains. Because someone told her that she told her 1,000 things that she could have any wish. Her wish was to be healthy and strong. Young people are affected by war. Some people say young people are the most affected by war. And young people like you are affected by all of the policies, all of the decisions, all of the rules, all of the laws that are passed that affect your lives. You should have some say in those. Do you agree? Yeah, come on. Back in Sasaki, she started holding her peace trains. And you can see a monument to her in Japan. She didn't make it to her goal of 1,000 peace trains. And so we have to continue her mission of carrying on the message of peace and holding those peace trains. And, and I was growing up, my father was a Methodist minister, and he went to Japan after the war. And he came back and told us about the peace train and told us about peace. And we sang songs in church like, you know, Jesus loves the little children. And we learned that peace is a way and that young people have stood up for peace and for so many advances in our world. And so we got that idea that that's a way to live, to speak up for what's right. As this Koromatsu said, standing up for what's right is something that ordinary people do. And so many of them have been young people, and still are today. In 1965, the Vietnam War was building up. And now us kids would watch on TV the scenes of the war, and the children were running from their burning huts. And we heard about something called napalm, which is a sticky gel that was made by Dow Chemical Company. Here in the United States, it's basically chemical warfare that was dropped onto the towns and villages of Vietnam. Well, they couldn't just aim it at the so-called enemy. It would get on everyone. It would get on the children. It would get on the families. And it would burn the skin. We heard about this. And you couldn't just wash it off. And now I'm a nurse, and I've taken care of many kids that had burns. But even then, I can imagine how it Because you feel the world and you say, we can do better. That's how we are men. 
because we wanted to use our rights, and we thought we should have some rights too. We wanted to speak up for peace. It was Christmas time, which is all about peace. And so we decided to wear simple black armbands to school to say that we were in favor of peace and that we were sad about war. Like Fred Koromatsu, we wanted to speak up for what was right. What we had learned was right. But the principals, not like your principals, they decided that that was to be done. That would be against the rules. And anybody wearing an armband to school would be suspended. And so then I didn't know what to do. I wasn't sure because I was an ordinary girl and I went roller skating and I studied and I had slumber parties and I didn't know if I should make such a big stand and maybe get in trouble. But in the end, I decided that I should. And I went to school and I was very scared and then I saw Mr. Overly, my math teacher, and he was standing at the door of the math class with a pig slip in his hand and I was really scared. And I went down to the office, and Miss Tanner, the girls' advisor, told me, Now, Mary Beckham says, Grace, to you, you're, you're a good student. Now, take that arm out. And I'm here. So, you just use a little bit of courage that you have in life. Sometimes you'll be amazed at what, what can happen, what you can do with that. And with my little bit of courage, it turned out that, well, I got suspended anyway, first of all. And then a group named the American Civil Union, which is just standing up for hundreds for the Bill of Rights. And they stood up for Fred Korematsu as well. Because they go to the Supreme Court more than any organization in the United States. Why? Because their whole mission is to stand for the Bill of Rights, and they thought that kids should have rights too. So when my brother John got suspended, and some other kids like uh, Bruce Clark and Chris Singer, there's my great mother and my great father. Because when you're standing up for something you believe in, it's not always going to be popular. And people threatened to bomb our house, and they threw red paint at our house, and my parents. Once we convinced them, yeah, these kids are also very persuasive. We convinced them, yeah, why we were doing what we were doing. We explained them, and then they stood by us. We were lucky for them. And there's Chris Singer and Bruce Clark, other kids, a few others got suspended. And when we got suspended, the American Civil Liberties Union came to help us. So they said, first, you have to go to the school board and try to change their mind. And that's a picture of us as a school board trying to change their mind. Just like Fred Karamatsu, some people voted for us, and they said, yes, that's right, those kids just should have the right to wear the armies. But they were outvoted, and so it went to court. And we lost at the district level. And the lawyers and the judges, you know, they said, no, these kids should not have broken the rules. They should not have done what your, your head of school said to challenge the way things are. And so we lost. And then went to the appeals court, where we lost the game. But eventually, when I was a junior in high school, thanks in great part to a group of African American students in Mississippi in 1964, who also spoke up during Mississippi Freedom Summer. And they wore buttons to school to protest the terror of the Ku Klux Klan and the killing of Cheney Schwarzer. Thanks in part to them as well, and to all of the civil rights workers who were part of that struggle. We won our case in 1969 at the Supreme Court by 7 to 2, and the judges, the Supreme Court justices, cited the Mississippi students in their ruling, saying that the Tinkers and the Eckharts and uh, the other students that had worn armbands in Des Moines, Iowa in 1965 did not disturb the school, and that neither teachers, leave their rights when they enter the schoolhouse gate. It was a great victory for students and teachers all over the United States. 
I, I became a nurse, I started working with young people, and I didn't have any idea that this was such an important piece. But life went on, and I found that I was meeting so many young people all over the country, and even all over the world. I hear about young people standing up and speaking up for their rights, because this is an international human rights issue. Children's rights, teenagers' rights. To speak up, and we see these wonderful articles that you're writing about in your newspapers. The world is a better place. We're able to benefit from your creativity and your ideas and your energy and your love because it's really all about love, as a teenage boy told me recently at a program. He says, You know, I think it's really all about love. And I think it is. The First Amendment is about love, it's about how we show respect for each other and how we show love for each other by encouraging each person to have a say in democracy. And that includes all of you young people. So thank you very much for having us here today, and thank you for this wonderful program. Stand up for your Thank you so much, Ms. Tinker and Mr. Lamonti. Uh, we now like to bring all new speakers to the stage for a question and answer session. Great. So we're going to open the floor to audience members to uh, ask questions. So if you have any, uh, any questions, please that will line up on uh, your left side of the auditorium. And uh, while you're lining up, we have a few questions for uh, our three speakers. Um, so this uh, question is for Ms. Tinker. Um, what was going through your mind the first time you entered the courtroom? What was going through my mind in the courtroom? I was very shy, and I was really intimidated and nervous. And I was just thinking, gee, I hope we say the right thing. You know, I hope I say the right thing. Kind of like I do right now. <laughs> That's what was going through my mind. And uh, this one is for Mr. Corbaccio. Uh, what is the most important lesson that you took away from your father's experience? I think the most important um, lesson that I always try to share with everyone is from the reaction that my father, or, or when my, my father told me, you know, why he had resisted the military orders. And and to have a sense of right and wrong. You know, that he felt deeply that, that he was right and the government was wrong. And so he, and he had to make a decision. He, um, which was, you know, very difficult at that time. But not only was he making that decision for himself, but he was also making that decision for his community. And I think once your cause is greater than yourself, then it is the right thing. But you have to truly believe it. You know, and people will tell you, I mean, even when my father's case was being reopened in, in 19... was to take his case all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, they didn't think that he should, but he thought he should. And so when you really believe, deep down inside it, you're doing the right thing, and it's peaceful, then you have to go with your gut and listen to yourself. Because in the end, it like Mary Beth, not, you know, not only, it's for the greater good for everyone. Uh, 
know this from this teacher. Um, how has the teacher tour across America uh, affected the high school girls community, the people that you speak to? Well, we're, we're, we're lighting a fire under young journalists, and I hope you all feel it today. You know, fire? My ass. Hey. Yeah, yeah. We want to encourage you. We love you, and we want to encourage you. So that's how we're. That's our message, right? Great inequality, racial discrimination, even war with the war economy. So yes, that's onward to equality and having all schools have a journalism program. Um, so this is also Ms. Taker. I was wondering what can we do as students more than just have like a journalism program or write in our sort of journal? Is there anything else that we can do to sort of have more influence in like the political sphere or any other like where area where we don't exactly have uh, what else? Yes, yes. What else can we do? Well, one city in Maryland, Tacoma Park, Maryland, they figured out what to do. The young people there, they succeeded in lowering the voting age to 16 for all local elections. So I'm calling for a lowering of the voting age to at least 16, but I'd leave it up to all of you to decide what age it really should be. Maybe it should be actually a little lower, I'm not sure. What do you think about that? The lower the voting age? What? Did you have a right to vote for your school board that runs your schools? Should you have a right to be on the school board with a vote? Did you know that only one county has a voting member on a school board with a student member? There's two. There's two, sorry. Um, so I would have to ask you all, what else, what else can you do? Let's hear from one of the students. What else can you do to stand up and speak up? You tell me. Tell me something. <laughs> Get me an idea. Who's got an idea? What was that? Who's got an idea? What did you do to speak up to stand up? Okay, who's got it? Come on, stand up. You gotta stand up right now to speak up. Abolish the dress code. Abolish the dress code. Okay, let's say this is. Who wants to abolish the dress code? Okay, let's say this is a good example. If there's something in life you want to change, you can either do nothing or you can do something. Let's say you, that is your issue. Let's say you pick an issue. You can do nothing. But that's a boring. Or you can do something about it. So if you really want to change the rest of it, you can use your five rights of the First Amendment, which are free press, free speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to petition, freedom of religion. You can use your rights to change this. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for having us here. Come on.
or things like can design our man for you. You can visit that in the fiber box or either lunch period. And just a couple of reminders, if you check the paper is out today, so you can read more about the case report there. And also, if you go to your place during lunch, so take advantage of your content and go vote. <laughs> Thank you.